train a lot, train a lot, train a lot. That's it. How the f are you gonna beat that guy? So, what kind of difference have you and other Muslims been making in the military? Oh, just you know, some of the things I told you in the beginning. You know, sisters can wear hijabs now in, in the your, military. Yeah, yeah, brothers wear beards. We have uh, uh, they can get off for Friday prayer with pay. All right, we teach them Arabic. You know, we have. Um, in Fort Hood, when I was there, we had the largest Eid in the military, uh, military history. Uh, I get a certain amount of money each month uh, to buy books and literature. So we've made we've made ardent strides. We uh, just came from the Pentagon. We have the Iftar at the Pentagon, and we just uh, did Eid at the White House. So we in the last twenty years, we've made phenomenal strides. Inshallah. So you were in the military during 9-11 and the Iraq war. That's uh, correct. First, how did you deal with the reality that the institution you worked for, therefore supported, was deliberately attacking a Muslim land uh, based off of false allegations of weapons of mass destruction? Well, and that's that's a that's a lot of politics. And one, one of the things we did was, as Muslims, we got a fatwa from Dr. Taha al -Waini. Uh, and that fatwa uh, is in line with the Quran that says specifically, uh, we are, we as Americans, uh, we are in right to defend ourselves. Uh, those um, planes hit that building. They kill Muslims, they kill Christians, and they kill Jews. So they also kill Muslims. And so the, what Dr. Taha al Waini said that as an American citizen, based upon the Quran, we are to follow the authority uh, of those who are in charge of us. So uh, all of the politics in that doesn't even matter to me. Uh, uh, we got a fatwa from our leader um, who was a graduate of Al Azhar uh, University and said we were well within our rights uh, as a members of this country to defend our country. And you didn't actually go out to war. You were, you were a trapper. <laughs> no, I went to war. I mean, but oh, you oh you went to war at that point. You yeah, weren't a chaplain. I was a chaplain, but I didn't, I didn't fight anybody. I mean, oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't fight anybody, but I was with units that were fight was fighting. And it, that didn't bother you at all, even personally. You, I know you said politics, but it's a moral and personal thing as well. Because nah, they were in Iraq un, unrightfully. I mean, it wasn't even that a place that attacked them. That didn't that didn't that didn't, bother, that didn't bother me. I was taking care of people, so. You know, you know, what's interesting is, you know, growing up as an African-American and seeing prejudice, discrimination and racism all around you. Right. I still have to function. Right. It's one of the great things about growing up uh, in a situation that is not uh, indicative of how human beings should live, live and still having to function because you have a family uh, at that point when you're talking about morals and integrity uh it is it's difficult difficult for me to grasp right because i got a function and so i i take my functionality and subscribe into what i need to do for my people i can't worry about what the president said i can't worry about what muslims say i can't worry about what the politician said i have a job to do and that job deals with integrity and values and morals right I take care of my people. I take care of the people that have been assigned to me. I can't worry about all of this stuff that's going around me. I think, I think if if I did that, if people did that, nobody would be working, right? Nobody would have a job because we're not just talking about a war here. Uh, I don't know where you work, but it's got some shady people that's at your work that's doing some shady stuff and selling some shady stuff to people, right? Or using interest and riba. Uh, what do you do about that? That's a moral issue, right? That's values issue. That's an integrity issue. But somehow we um, don't subscribe to those things. We subscribe to people and to places like army and you know all the political world. You know, we got to function. It's easy to throw stones uh, at me, but at the end of the day, I probably can look at your job and tell you, you probably shouldn't be working there either because they have no idea what my responsibility is and what I deal with every day. 
on behalf of the Muslims. How how was how, uh, how was Guantanamo Bay? How was that? You just get, recently got back this week. That was great because um, some of the things I do as a Muslim chaplain um, are intricate uh, to helping out the Muslim folks, with not only uh, the Muslim um, detainees, but also the Muslims on base. So uh, we help soldiers get uh, Arabic supplies. We help soldiers get Qurans. We help soldiers write memos for hijabs, beards, Friday prayer, Ramadan. Eid, uh, halal food in the dining facility, and some and cultural awareness. But I did two cultural awareness classes while we're there. While I was there, so uh, these are things that I would say only I could do uh, in the military context because there's only four imams in the military, and so I just happen to be the highest ranking uh, Muslim chaplain in military history. Uh, so I'm called out to do a lot of those things. And some of the insight that you give people who are not practicing our faith, non-Muslims, they're fascinated. Uh, and that's why uh, we have to be in that space. Uh, people can have all the political views they want to say that Muslims shouldn't be uh, in the military, uh, but they're really speaking out of ignorance uh, because there are some 5,000 Muslims in the military. Uh, and therefore, who's going to be there to take care of? You know, somebody has to do it, and I'm glad I'm the person that's doing it. Okay, that that's that's interesting. So, what what did you do over there? I just, you know, I just interviewed Muazzam Beg last week. I told you that, yeah. right? You told me, yeah, you told me. So, what what I did, uh, I go over and check the um, to ensure that they're getting halal meals. I check the menu. I ensure that the deep the dining facility. Uh, is halal. All the food that they're getting is halal. All of the desserts, everything that they're getting, I make sure it's halal. I make sure that all of their religious needs are taken care of. They get to pray on time. Uh, they get to do anything uh, that is in accord with our religion. I get, I get to go um, very honorably and go certify all of those things to make sure that they are treating the, those folks right. Did you get to talk to any of them, any of the Guantanamo Bay prisoners? I can't tell you, but yeah, the, my job over there is very, um, is very essential. And all of that stuff is classified. What about it? Can you tell me that's not classified? Can you tell me the conditions that are over there? What living yeah, all conditions they're under? Yeah, all, all of that's classified, but I, I can just tell you, I can't tell you specific conditions, but they're living very well. They're being taken care of very well. Really? Absolutely. Because as you know, Guantanamo Bay is notorious for being an oppressive prison state or prison industry. Yeah, allegedly. But, I, you know, I was there 20 years ago. I was one of the first imams to go in. Uh, I replaced um, the uh, young man, the young Muslim chaplain that was arrested. Uh, I went in and uh, thank, thank Allah that... Uh, they allowed me to, you know, make conditions um, better. Um, and so with all of, without all of the political uh, ramifications of whatever goes on and whatever the folks there, you know, my job uh, as the imam uh, is to ensure that I advise the commander uh, that conditions are better. That's, that's all I can say about that. Hmm. But if you yeah. sat down with Mazen Beg, who was there for two years and was in solitary confinement and, you know, had some of the worst situations happening to him. Yeah. Uh, would you be able to tell him that the conditions are good there, that everything's good or? Well, I mean, there, there's two different perspectives. Uh, he was in there. Right. And so a person that's in there is probably going to have a different perspective than a person that's trying to, that's outside of that. Like, you know, people could, you could tell me anything you want about the military and tell me all the bad things that you heard about the military. And I could very adequately say to you, yeah, you don't, you don't understand. I'm in the military. I've been in the military for 28 years. So my perspective is going to be different from yours. You understand? So his perspective is going to be totally different from mine uh, because he was inside and I was outside. And so maybe um, 
doing a real conversation, he can't see the improvements. He can only see his own situation. I see. Do you have, is there a common misconception of places like Guantanamo Bay that you think people should know about? There's a lot of misconceptions about a lot of things. Uh, I can just tell you from my foxhole, uh, sometimes uh, people don't understand um, what the intent of, of uh, leaders are. Uh, and I, from 2004 to 2023, man, the conditions. I mean, we're talking, I just left there to certify halal meals. Think about that. Let's, let's think in a big picture here. Uh, let's go to a regular prison. You think they're making those type of concessions for regular prisoners, detainees in this case? No, they're not. And so, you know, the, and I don't want to get too technical here, but they're making a lot of concessions to ensure uh, that those things are met. And so when you look at it from that perspective, you know, they're really going above and beyond. Um, and we're not talking about politics here. We're not talking about why they're in there. We're not talking about any of that stuff, but I'm talking about making sure their religious needs are taken care of. That's that in itself. I mean, <laughs> that's huge. I mean, that's huge. And, and that's, that's for me, I was like, wow, you're bringing a, an imam down to certify that they have halal meals. That's, that's phenomenal. Yeah, but couldn't you also say that there is only one religious people that are there, which are Muslims, and so that that's why, and and they are only there because they're Muslim, and they don't even have a fair trial or have well, gone not, through any not, regular not, legal proceeding. As yeah, but we we're not talking about legalities. We're not talking about them being the only people down there. We're talking about what they're doing to make sure that they're taken care of. I don't care about any of the politics. I don't care about the legalities. I don't care about what's happening behind the scenes. That's not my lane. My lane is to ensure that they're being treated um, with dignity and respect, right? And so that's the only area that I'm in. I don't, I don't get into the other stuff. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a politician. I'm an imam, right? And so people want to get into the extraneous uh, why they were there, why they were picked up. It, yeah, that's not my lane. And so this is where people get themselves intertangled into to religion and culture um, and start to, to, to me, mix up things. And I, I just, I used to do that when I was a younger person and it just, it confused me <laughs> from being close to my religion. Um, as a matter of fact, I'll tell you something. You know, everybody who wants to con convert to Islam, when they come to me, I always ask them, are you coming to, to Islam uh, for spiritual guidance? Or are you coming to be a political person? Because every, everything that you're telling me, not you, but everything that you're telling me right now deals with politics. You're talking about your hatred for, for other religions. You're talking about what the other religions aren't doing right. Have you studied the religion and is this religion for you spiritually, right? And the answer is always so confounding to them, right? For me, I came to Islam spiritually because I needed to change my life. I was focused specifically on what the Quran says. You know, the Quran, when I picked it up, it was, it was such a beautiful revelation. It says, uh, I mean, that blew my mind. It says, this book is a book of guidance and there's no doubt in it. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Who will study this book for, for an 82 how it should be studied? Another mind blowing thing. It tells, tells people to bring any challenge you want. You can't dispute it. No other book I had read challenged me intellectually like that. And I grew up Christian and I went to Jarvis Christian College. So for me, sometimes Muslims come to Islam 
and they evolved in a whole lot of politics. And this is why spiritually, in my opinion, that's one of the books that I wrote, while we have a lot of Muslims, we haven't grown uh, to the level that we're supposed to grow because we're so engrossed in what other people are doing wrong and we're not growing personally uh, in our spirituality. My humble opinion. Yeah. You've gone through a lot, man. You've almost... You've almost attempted suicide, and now you are where you are. Mashallah, subhanAllah. What, what's your reflection on, on all of this? That Allah is subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, he, he, when people really look at me, they know God is real. I, my, my story it's such a fascinating story. <laughs> I mean, I think it's quite evident what you can do when you put your trust and faith in the Lord of the worlds, right? Um, and so when I reflect back, man, I think I'm glad that I had an opportunity to live. Yeah, I'm glad I had an opportunity to live for my, my wife and my children to see that it's possible to do whatever you want to do. You just got to stay focused. This is the Ansari Podcast.